Going to be honest, as little as a couple of years ago, if you'd asked me about Mallorca, I probably would have reeled off a withering screed to the effect of... Gah, why would anyone go there? It's just a load of British tourists lounging on beaches, swearing at their disgusting children. So, what changed? Well, it went something like this. Hey, so you, uh, you heard about the Taliots? Uh, no, sorry, the what? The, uh, Taliots, these ancient stone structures. I have not. Those look uh, pretty cool. Yeah, and they're littered across uh, Menorca and Mallorca. There's so many you could... Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, uh, Mallorca, is that with a J or two L's? Uh, you keep talking, I'm just booking flights. So after that, I didn't need much convincing. We ended up with six days to explore both Mallorca and Menorca and get around as many Taliotic sites as you can eat. But what about the rest of the islands? Could you get away from the tourist tat that seems to germinate wherever the British go, like a particularly ignorant fungus? Like, what would the rest of the islands be like? So we flew out in... Oh probably should do an intro. The very first glimpse we got of Mallorca was of the mountains on the northwestern coast emerging from the clouds. I really love these shots. This was an incredible treat and we hadn't even landed yet. This is going to be an unusual video to make. Most of the places we've been, we're writing in the knowledge that most people probably haven't been there yet. Whereas Mallorca, quite a lot of you, in the UK at least, might have been there as kids on some sort of family holiday. Uh, we never really got to go abroad when I was a kid, apart from a scattered couple of exceptions. So if I sound a bit naively excited about something you saw years ago, I mean, cut me a break. This was all new for me at least. First impressions. Well, it's definitely a lot greener than I expected. There's always that stark difference when you take off in the UK and there's green everywhere, then you wake up after a mid-flight nap. You look down in Spain, it's kind of parched. We were visiting in February, bear in mind, so I don't know, it's possible that by summer the whole countryside reverts to this colour. Through a shiny, if a bit empty, Palma airport, hopped off the bus to the east of the centre of Palma. Palma is the capital of the island, and there's a lot going on there. We weren't able to stop and enjoy it just yet, as we were running a bit late to meet our Airbnb host, so we went pretty quickly through the side streets. Already I had a great feeling that you only get in the European historic towns, the closed-in streets, the balconies, and the still cool of the shade. Then all of a sudden we rounded the corner and whoa that's wow that's that's quite a view quick drop of our bags at a modest airbnb you know us we always go cheap and then being february the daylight would be gone by 7 p.m and it was already mid-afternoon so we headed out to make the most low angle flag shot so palmer Palmer is quite a town apart from all the modern busyness the architecture was incredible i was already thinking Man, I owe Mallorca an apology. I had no concept that it would be quite this beautiful and historic. As well as the historic arches and the columns of the various buildings, along the waterfront there were quite remarkable bastion defences. I was getting quite strong Malta vibes, the protruding forts, the palm trees so numerous it's practically a plague. I was absolutely buzzing. So we worked our way back to start at the Islamic Palace, and it's closed on Mondays. Okay, well, no worries, we'll just head to the Arab bar. Nope, they're closed on Mondays as well. So, wait, is everything closed on Mondays? Yes, well, unless you want to buy some sunglasses at around 11pm, in which case, come on in. This was going to really screw with the already tight itinerary. You'll see opening times becomes a bit of a theme through this trip. Much as I was having a bit of a sulk, watching the extraordinary architecture turn gold in the evening light along the waterfront, that was pretty incredible, even without entry to any of the places we wanted to see. I just couldn't get over how distinctive and bold Palma was. Wherever the British go, we have this really ugly habit of coercing tourist spots to be remade in our image. Tacky resorts, cheap nasty food and coffee, homogenous apartments, essentially just ruining everywhere we go en masse. I couldn't have been happier that the capital was completely unfazed by the English and had such a distinctive identity and beauty of its own. I couldn't get over how elegant it all was. So after mooching around the historic waterfront, we headed inland for a bite. This coffee and pastry was pretty good. Not masterful, but definitely welcome. Took in the streets as the light went, took a breather. If you're new to the channel, I don't really cover food on this blog. Coffee, yes, but we just simply don't have the budget to drop a ton of money on food on holiday, so what we're eating isn't all that special, and none of it was really all that worth photographing. So, cut to early next morning, where I was impatiently waiting to get up and run around with the camera. Side note, I had some incredible friends with me on this one, but I wasn't pointing the camera at them all that much. Followed the marina south and west to get up higher and to catch the sunrise. Thankfully, this gate was unlocked and I headed up to the hill to get a view over the city. Ah, good to see the plague ships were in. This was up by Castle Belva, which is one of the big attractions of the island. I, um, hmm. This castle is genuinely historic, and I mean, I'd rather have visited it than not. 
It's been restored and from the outside at least, it looks like those tower blocks are actually older than this stonework here. I've since learned it's a bit more interesting. There aren't many circular castles in Europe, so this is a bit of a novelty, but still can't figure out what they're thinking with the outside. I don't know, since it was shut on Monday and we couldn't fit it anywhere else, it kind of got squeezed out of the itinerary. Just be aware, there's a not inconsiderable number of steps to get up here. Also saw some of the less tidy parts of the city, but everywhere has them. Kind of makes the place more interesting, to be honest. While we were in the center, there were all these lights that looked a bit like Christmas decorations, but I just assumed, ah, cool, guess the city has these cool lights to uh, color the town, all right. So on my way back, I walked past this cherry picker. Turns out they were taking down their Christmas decorations halfway through February. Well, good to know you guys aren't superstitious. So it was off to the airport. Oh wait, uh, quick coffee at Urban Cafe with a particularly urban apricot tart. <laughs> I mean, it was all right for two euros. Then it was off to the airport to pick up our hire car. So the tail yachts I mentioned at the beginning, anyone who's spent time visiting ancient sites can tell you they're not usually found in dense urban areas, or in fact, anywhere near anything resembling public transport. So we could have run up a four figure cab fare trying to get to them all, or just hire a car. With a bit of hunting, we got one for about 46 pounds, and that's without all the ridiculous one grand credit card deposits that the big hire companies still try and convince you is absolutely necessary. Yeah, to hell with those guys. Always look for the local company that doesn't need a credit card. These guys are pretty fair. So the middle of Mallorca, well, so many windmills. I've seen a lot of these on the flight in. There's differing numbers out there on how many there are. There's a remarkable number surviving, probably down to how poetic they look. General rule, that type is for grinding flour, this type is for pumping water. For the most part, the center of the island is quite low key. You know, not terrible, just, you know, quiet. Now, it's at this point that interests may diverge. I'd got us to this ruined Byzantine basilica, but if you don't have a clue what that means, it's unlikely your enthusiasm for this will increase with a visit. It's actually a very significant site as far as the history of the Balearic Islands in the 5th to 8th centuries go, but uh, I won't dwell on it here. You may have already gathered that we're uh, cooking up some historic content, so I'll save it for that. Likewise, our first Taleotic site, the uh, Se Passe village, I don't know how that's pronounced, will divide opinions. Uh, my friends were pretty much equal parts curious and bored with these, so using them as a litmus for the everyday man, you'll uh, probably already know whether or not you have an interest in these. I mean, I think it's worth it as a site more than 3,000 years old, but if it mainly just reminds you of the Flintstones, yeah, maybe this isn't your thing. The site is right by the town of Arta, so we stopped there for a quick coffee. This place was all right. Don't forget to drink heel tea. Arta itself is quite nice. A few shops selling eye-catching bits, some people waiting at a station for a train that I'm pretty sure is not coming. The town gets prettier as you climb the hill. The fortified sanctuary of San Salvador at the top is pretty special. Some great views of the town on your way up. Nice to walk the ramparts and enjoy the views across the northeast tip of the island. Once again, a not inconsiderable number of steps up, but it's not as bad as a Venetian fort. This definitely made the stop worthwhile. Feel free to skip the museum, by the way, unless you're really keen. There's a little bit there from Se Passe and a few Carthaginian bits, and that's about it. From there, we headed on to some more Taleotic sites. Some were pretty exciting, even if you're not into the history. This one, as Taleot Son Fred, was pretty cool to head through the passageway. The roads had got considerably narrower, making the drive more stressful. Uh, we ran to a herd of sheep at one point. Tried to visit the Museum of Son Fornes at Manacor, but it was closed. Well, of course it was. I mean, why would you stay open for more than four hours a day? The nice windmill on top wasn't much consolation. With the group flagging a bit, it had been quite a long day of driving. We made the tail yacht of Son Fornes our final stop, and this one was pretty good for the uninitiated. It's kind of a whole village layout, and it gives you a good idea what the place would have looked like. There's an unfilmed saga here of us trying and failing very stressfully to find a parking space in Palma by staying on the outskirts, and that failed 100%. So we ended up right in the center of Palma, to be honest, if you keep to this motorway that skirts around the water, it's actually not too bad driving-wise. Anyway, time to relax. One of these recycling trucks visited us around midnight and serenaded us a few inches from our window. Up early again. Since yesterday's sunrise had been a bit cloudy, I was keen to find a better one. Ducked in and out of the dark streets to see what I could find, and just in time I headed to the edge of the water for the main event and... Ooh, pretty happy with that one. This was an incredible morning. Not just being by the water, but seeing the sun light up the cathedral and stepping back to see the spires dot the skyline of Palma. Almost floated back through the streets. Took in a few churches, including the convent of Santa Clara and this one. 
It seems to happen a lot in Spain. You have these churches that get built so tightly amongst other buildings, it appears the designers forgot to build a door. It's just kind of frustrating not being able to back up and appreciate the architecture. Definitely earned the espresso that morning. Had a quick one at S. Rebost. Uh, this was a good espresso, but more importantly, it was also a chance to try one of these. This is an Ensaimada. Um, it's actually a local specialty specific to Mallorca. It's kind of like a donut without jam. I mean, it's not a life-changing snack, but it's pretty nice, and it's cool to sample something authentically local to the island. So make a point of grabbing one of these while you're out there. So we had a lot to do today. Uh, first of all, we had to get the car back to the airport, which actually turned out to be much harder to do, navigating this labyrinthine multi-story, which is not wholly interconnected floor by floor. Again, no particularly riveting footage here. This put us a bit late, so we got back and finally headed to the Arab Baths. This, while small, is something I've been itching to go see. If you've seen our very first episode on Al-Andalus, or if you know a smidge about European history, you'll know that the Iberian Peninsula was ruled by the Emirate of Cordoba from about 711 AD, and then the Islamic rule gradually waned after the beginning of the 11th century. Well, the Balearic Islands were conquered a bit later, and the Islamic rule lasted from about 902 till 1229. However, there's very little architecture on the islands that survives from this period, and one of the most significant are these baths. A small site, but a peaceful oasis set in a nice garden and a rather spectacular chamber with numerous Corinthian columns. Only a couple of euros in, it's well worth a look. If this description seems a bit short, it's because, well, our visit had to be as well. We had all of the Monday stuff to do today as well. So next, it was the Islamic Palace. Now, I realize it sounds like I'm contradicting myself here, having just said that the Baths one of the most significant pieces of Islamic architecture. So here's the thing. Having seen the Alcazar of Seville or the Alhambra or the Islamic architecture of Morocco, we thought we were in for a real treat. Mm. Instead, both the adornment and the architecture of the Mallorca Palace was remarkably austere. Elsewhere in Spain, the Christians openly admired the Islamic architecture and art style, and not only kept intact when they conquered Islamic sites, but sometimes even produced their own work in a sympathetic style. In Mallorca, they seem to have attempted to do away with it entirely. I mean, goodness knows what this place would have looked like in its heyday. Instead, bare floors, plain archways, can't tell for sure, but I have a hunch these might have formerly been horseshoe arches that have then been remodeled to a Romanesque form. Some tapestries that are a bit hard to get excited about, quite a beautiful chapel, a nice if plain courtyard, and some modern furnishing upstairs. It was all rather sad, really. I can only hope that the architect, Ponch Descol, who was apparently charged with remodeling the castle in the 14th century, I hope he knew just how outclassed he was by his Islamic predecessors. We hit a bit of a road bump here. You'll excuse me that I don't really have the footage to illustrate this properly. So we were a group of five and we wanted to get to Alcudia. Okay, that's easy, there's a bus. Aha, except the bus was at 12 and there was a bus at two and we were not gonna be able to make it across town for the bus for 12 and you wanna take a wild guess when the Roman ruins at Alcudia closed? Well, actually, we learned later it was 3.30, but according to Google, 2.30. Okay, well, we could just get a cab. Yeah, well, I would have loved to, except, and it took us a while to get to the bottom of this, apparently, the laws Palmer uses to license taxis state they cannot exceed four passengers. There's a little travel parable here. Just because you assume that some things will work according to common good sense, doesn't mean they necessarily will. Common sense says that booking a cab for five people from a major city should be about as complicated as buying a packet of crisps. But no, Palmer has deliberately purged itself of all taxis five seats and above, meaning we'd have to pay for two cabs at, yeah, double the cost. Providentially or otherwise, the group diverged and three of us split a 65 euro cab fare while two went elsewhere. It makes for an object lesson in the difficulty of arranging a travel itinerary with both tight time and budget constraints, which is, well, I think I might need those principles inscribed in Latin on some sort of family crest. Anyway, biting the bullet and paying a bit of a steep cab fare, got to the Roman ruins at Alcudia, which were pretty great. Popped into the museum, that did close at 2.30, so we had to be quick. After that, a quick and pretty average sangria from this place. The walls of Alcudia are pretty beautiful and you can walk a fair sized section of them. There's a few places where you have to walk across a gap and it's fun how the planks are coming loose. As for the rest of the town, almost entirely deserted streets appear to weave into the center. It's a pretty sedate place, all told. Uh, we wanted to get to one more stop, so we took another cab. 
you'll never guess, the first and only cab that was at the rank in Alcudia, a six-seater cab. It's like a bad joke, it really is. Turns out outside of Parma, they're entirely common. Even the cab driver at Alcudia was confused about the whole Parma thing. He just assumed, like us, that they'd be available everywhere. We pitched up just a bit along from Alcudia at the beach of Can Picafort. A uh, lovely beach though it was, we weren't actually there for the sand. A short walk with some gorgeous mountains in both directions. And this, this is the Son Real Necropolis. A series of burials from the 6th to the 2nd centuries BC in this incredible location. Unsurprisingly, this close to the sea, it's at considerable risk of erosion. Obviously, some repair and restoration has had to take place. Look, even if you don't care about the history, you can't help but admit, this is pretty badass. So that was a high point. I mean, what a place to be. Can I just point out again, February. And as long as you don't stay in the shade too long, t-shirt weather. I'm sure on the island, that's normal to the point of entirely uninteresting. But as a Brit, it's a rare luxury. So now we had to get back to Palmer. Didn't want to drop another 60 euros on a cab. And since time wasn't a factor anymore, we could take the bus. This corner of Can Picafort, while lovely, is total ghost town. I, still, I never get used to this phenomenon, how somewhere just ceases to exist outside of May to September. Particularly funny seeing an entire ice cream van opaque cling wrapped like some sort of elaborate prank. So while we were skeptical it would ever turn up, this area is actually still served by buses in winter. So our bus had this strange habit of the back door flinging itself open while we were still traveling at full speed, several times touched my bag a little bit closer. So that bus got us as far as Inca, where we joined a train. Yeah, in spite of my research before coming, I had not picked up there were trains on Mallorca. Islands often don't bother laying tracks. It's a bit limited. They weren't going anywhere I had picked out on my itinerary, hence how I'd missed it. But hey, it was pretty good. Got us back home to Palma pretty rapidly as the sun set. That had been a long day. The light was gone, so I didn't really get any more footage. And all too soon, it's nearly time to wrap up the episode. The following morning, we were going to need two of those four-seater cabs for a very early start to the port of Alcudia to get a ferry over to Menorca for the next part of the adventure, which we're saving for the next episode. So, some miscellaneous observations to finish. You might have noticed that the weather was pretty amazing. The temperatures for February were basically as hot as it can be without it being uncomfortable, which is great. I'd forgotten. We'd encountered the same thing in Andalusia, where autumn comes way later than the UK. This is December for reference, and even in February here on Mallorca, it seemed like autumn wasn't fully done. The bare trees everywhere would have been nicer with a summer coating of green. The coffee we had was okay, not spectacular, but no. The main frustration, as you've no doubt gathered, is winter opening times. Anything that needed a human at the front desk pretty much ceased to exist after two o'clock. Like I said earlier, it might make logical sense that of course national monuments would be open on a Monday, or that it would make no sense to open at 10 a.m. only to close again scarcely four hours later. Look, stop typing, we all know about the siesta. As a Brit, it seems rather incongruous, but yes, having to get all of your major sightseeing done between 10 and 2 was extremely frustrating, and straightjacketed a lot of our days to a maddening degree. Also on that, don't know if you're wondering, we didn't go inside the cathedral in the end, we were about to, but they don't allow backpacks, cameras, mobile phones, oh, seriously? food, water, clothing, or breathable oxygen. So yes, that will be eight euros, please. Ooh, yes, no, please do take my camera and all my personal belongings off me like an airport security check, but three times more stringent. Seriously, Palmer Cathedral, what, what, you think you're so special? I have never before or since come across a cathedral in Europe who wants to actively punish visitors quite as much as you seem to. So we just enjoyed the outside instead. It would have been nice to see, but we were short on time and euros, and I couldn't film it for all of you, so what would be the use? So that ends our part one, but we had a lot more still to cover. So the Taylotic sites on Mallorca are pretty incredible, but Menorca has actual hundreds of these sites. It's, yeah, it's unbelievable. So we'll see you in part two. Meanwhile, every episode we do, we make the music that you've been hearing in the background. There's an EP for these episodes and you can get that on bandcamp.com. If you want to support the channel, that's the place to do it. Catch you guys on the next episode.